Welcome to the sixth episode of Guerrilla Journalism. And today we have a very exciting guest because it's someone who's really out there in the field. His name is Darius Ascari, and he is a war photographer. He goes to some of the most dangerous areas in order to capture images and to bring back home to people some idea of what's going on. Let's get right into this. Darius, when you're out there in one of the conflict zones, what is it that you're trying to capture? What is it that you're trying to communicate to people? It's a good question. Um, it depends on the situation, the circumstance, because it's very different than, say, a studio setting um, or even, in a way, spot journalism, where you are going to a news event, you're capturing it, and you're, you know, it, it's a much more controlled environment. A lot of times you go with an overall agenda. The example that I give is you know you want to bake a cake. You're not exactly sure what type of cake you want to bake, so you go to the supermarket and Looking at the ingredients, you feel like, okay, I have an option for a strawberry shortcake cake. I can make a, a chocolate cake or I can make a, a cheesecake. But you're still unsure of exactly how you're going to go about that. So you buy all the ingredients you possibly can and figure I'll figure it out when I get home. And oftentimes the cake you end up making is not the cake you intended to make because the ingredients you got were very different than what you thought. I went out there with the intention of capturing images of, of people telling their stories, what I would call visual testimony. I didn't really know how it would play out. I had never been in a war before when I went to Iraq, to Mosul, Iraq. And in coming uh, after my first trip, I decided that video was what was more important than actual still photos. And I made a shift to video. I went to the oil fields of Gayara that ISIS would light on fire and the smoke billowing out. Um, covering literally the sunlight and the way that the light would cut through the smoke and the just a very photogenic place that literally felt like being in hell. Um, and that for me changed a bit, literally just looking up and seeing the smoke swirl in the sky. I felt as though this, this was a place that would kind of birth the story that I wanted to create. And I sat with some firefighters that were putting out the fires that ISIS had started. Um, and one thing led to another. So I didn't have an exact specific uh, plan to orchestrate on. The content that I got dictated the story that I'm telling now through this movie that I'm creating. So maybe not the best answer, but uh, kind of just went on a whim and figured I'd see what I would get. How much of what you're doing is planned in advance and how much is it is just happenstance? Things that uh, happen when you're out there. So, for example... Uh, when you're shooting, do you already know what it is that you're going to be uh, making the, the subject about? Or is it once you get back in the editing room that you really know? When you're out there, it's almost, uh, it's the, the shows I would see when I was younger where someone had a minute to go through a supermarket and take all the stuff that they wanted for Korea, shopping spree. So it's kind of like that. You grab everything you can, and not until you're actually back in front of your computer or the editing room that you can sit back in a safe area where no one's shooting at you and really digest what it is that you got and, and piece together a narrative from that. So in the field, it's, it's very difficult to dictate what you want, but then you start to find these little gems that will lead you and direct you, direct your path. For instance, I went to West Erbil Emergency Hospital and met with a grandmother who her children had died um, from a US airstrike and her grandchild was all that she had left in the world. And she, she battled with the fact that I was American because it wasn't ISIS that actually had taken her family from her. Uh, it was the Americans, the American airstrike. And she still was open enough after a lot of coaxing to share her story with me. Uh, and, and from that, I ended up meeting uh, a woman uh, that I won't mention her name because she still has some family in some questionable areas. I promised I wouldn't compromise her. And her sharing her story with me was she is actually the voice of my documentary I'm working on now. So she is the arc of the story, and she's putting in, interjecting these segments that speak about from the day that ISIS entered the, the city up until the point that her family actually escaped and an IED actually went off, and all of her family um, was uh, affected by that. Luckily, they all lived. So that became the narrative for the story, and the the parts that kind of plug in the gaps are 
testimony that supports her overall story, her overall arch. So if there's some young person or other who wants to become a war photographer like yourself, what kind of advice in general terms would you give them? The first thing is, uh, and I'm American, so I, I can say this, in the Western world, there, I don't want to say for the most part, but there are many instances where the Islamic world in the Middle East has negative connotation attached to it. That any person that, um, you know, uh, praise, you know, moving their hands, the movement of being a, a Muslim has some ulterior motive of, of ultimate demise for the Western world and maybe even their own people. And part of my, my documentary is showing that some of the nicest people I met were Muslims. It was actually Muslims killing Muslims. And I don't count ISIS as being Muslim. They were fanatical, insane, maniacal people that were not true Muslims, true Islam is about acceptance. It's about hospitality. And I'd have a, a person, part of their culture, if I commented that he had a nice shirt, before I could finish even the, the, the word shirt, he's taking it off his back to give to me. Just because he, it was something that I liked. And um, I have never been met with, with such beauty and love and admiration, hospitality as I have. So my documentary is trying to show a clear divide mainly to the Western world, and quite frankly, anywhere, uh, that shows that Islam should not equate to bombs going off and not equate to fanaticism, that the average person that is Muslim and, and follows the faith of Islam is actually peaceful and happy and wants the same thing that us Westerners would want. Uh, a lot of my, my movies actually showing these, these normal, intimate moments that anyone could associate going to the supermarket and literally picking up a piece of fruit and feeling if it's right, sitting at the dinner table with your family and the father making fun of his son because he didn't play well, you know, at the football match that day. Uh, these tender moments that all of us as people, no matter race, religion, creed, location, can all connect to and showing that these people suffered in a way that the majority of us in the West could never imagine. And they still are resilient. They still have come out the other side of it and still have faith in humanity overall. So it may be idealistic, but I feel as though a visual narrative, a, a documentary can convey that and have it be something where a person leaves that documentary and it changes their thought process just a little bit, even a, a mere fraction to the point that it can spill out in at a dinner table with their family about this documentary that they saw. So I really just want to create a dialogue and I, I want there to be some level of true understanding of what is going on in the Middle East, uh, especially with some of the propaganda that goes both ways. There being a, a certain reality injected into that and it not coming from me, it coming directly from the voice of these people and their actual testimony of what they went through. Where is it when you're out there in the field that you find this information that you need to keep you safe? Number one, you got to do your, your homework. Um, that is the number one thing. You, you, can't, you can't just show up in a war zone and learn on the job. It's a very difficult thing. So I think first, the first aspect is the technical aspect of actually taking a photo, understanding what a visual narrative is. It's almost like if a person wants to build a house, even though they may not know what the house is they want to build, they should have a general contractor's license. Um, so there should be a base understanding of the actual mechanics of how to use the machinery that they have because it needs to be second nature. When there's bullets whizzing by and you have to make a decision of do I duck behind something or do I take the photo, you can't be thinking about I need to get my settings right now, right? It needs to become second nature. So that's number one. Practice, practice, practice until it just is as easy as walking one foot in front of the other. Second part is genuinely researching where they're going, knowing the customs of the area, understanding the political situation that's happening, know who the players are in the region. Um, know who the different factions are. In, in Iraq, you had the Hashid al-Shabi, which is Shia militia that was taking their orders from Iran. They had issues with the Kurdish forces. And you had the Peshmerga that were Kurdish forces that had issue with the PKK that was in Syria. Uh, and then you have uh, uh, Asiyaj, which is almost the intelligence faction of the Kurdish forces, knowing where their borders are, how they interact, knowing that there is an actual Christian militia that's part of that region and where they're actually located and knowing which factions actually hate each other, even knowing the factions within the military itself, knowing who's part of the 
coalition forces. So if you show up and you don't know that stuff, you are at a huge disadvantage and it makes it that much more difficult to truly embed and interact with the people. So I'd say understand mechanics first, um, understand the actual aspect of a visual narrative. And I would suggest that someone cut their teeth doing some softer, easier stories first and then segue into, into actual conflict, armed conflict. Where is it when you're out there in the field that you find this information that you need to keep you safe? Uh, the, the internet, the beautiful thing is the internet now has made things very easy. Uh, before I went to Iraq, I spent a lot of time in an actual chat group for journalists that was on Facebook. And people, for the most part, though there is a high level of competition, they're still sharing information with each other. Uh, at the end of the day, us journalists, we can't necessarily rely on the military that we're embedding with or interacting with for protection um, at least from an intelligence uh, standpoint, uh, we have to rely on each other. So the journalism community is actually one that's very supportive of each other, even though it's very competitive. So even being part of that chat group before I went out there, I'd ask questions and there'd be some comments like, you should know that. But for the most part, people were sharing that info. Then when you get on the ground, it's not day one I land and I'm going right to the, the front line. It's spending time with the right fixer the right translator, the right connected people, and and learning from them and absorbing from them, and then you go out in the field. So that's how I'd recommend that someone do it. Do people actually make a living being war photographers? Is it something that uh, you know a career can be built upon? If people are making a living at it, that living is very meager. Uh, let's put it that way. If, if someone wants to become a millionaire um, and they expect to do it from this, you probably have a better chance of winning lotto. Uh, so it, it is not, a, it is not a, a for-profit type of business. And I think if it is for-profit, you're not going to go very far. It's got to be passion, something you're genuinely interested in. And you really do care about the story. I don't even like to use the word subjects because I feel it, it um, depersonalizes the, the individual that you're dealing with. But um, yeah, it, it is very difficult to, to make a true living from it. Um, luckily for me, I have a, a business and I have things outside of this world that I can. It allows me to afford to do this. I am self-funding all of it. Um, I paid for the, the any personnel I worked with, any fixers. And in war zones, oftentimes a lot of the people that you are relying on to help you, the majority of them are obviously they're doing it for profit and they will try to help. But there are people, um, negative players, that will try to take advantage of the desperation of the situation you're abandoned somewhere. You have to get a ride out of somewhere. Someone from the kindness of their heart may take you, hop in the flat bed and will take you out. Someone else will say, well, I want the equivalent of a couple hundred dollars to take you out of here. So that can be a difficult thing, but making a living from it is difficult. It's getting information that, uh, getting content that is truly unique, being able to have contacts at certain publications, being able to at least say, hey, I know you're not going to actually pay or commission me to go out there, but can I show you my work? And if you like it, then you buy it. But don't give things away for free. That devalues the, the whole um, economic side of it. But it is a difficult thing to really eke out a living. And there's a very small population of people that have made it big, financially speaking, from this happening. So why is it that someone would want to choose this kind of career path for themselves? Uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages of doing this? At the end of the day, you have to choose a story that truly resonates with you. I think just the, I find a lot of people have asked me, I want to go to war. And my question is, well, why? And you get the normal answers of, I, I want to make a difference. But you know, it's excitement. It's the adrenaline. I haven't been there before. There's no shame in saying that. But you had better choose a war that has some deep connection to you in some way. And you, when you get there, you had better find some people that it's worth you risking your life for. I think at the end of the day, that's what's happening in a, a conflict situation. And you legitimately should be risking your life for something that is, is worth that risk. And these people's story for me, it's definitely that. So I think they have got to find that, that true why and going to have a good time with bombs and you know, weaponry around you and artillery fire can't justify that um that's probably the easiest way to lose your life out there so find a story that really resonates with you fall in love with it and become ridiculously obsessed with it where almost nothing else matters and 
oddly enough, the work will catch up to that desire. So, best bit of uh, advice I can give.